So, I always do this, I uh, share this one time during the semester, so this is my day. Psalm 13, I trusted in thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my God, my times. What happens to me is in your hand. And Psalm 75, 6 through 7, promotion neither comes from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God's the judge, he puts down one and setteth up another. It's hard to believe, really, throughout your life that God is really in control as, as you think he is. But um, even in your career. So, for example, when I got out, I finished my MBA, and I wanted to get promoted at at and bad. I mean, bad. And the rule at at and was basically when you're, if you're 35 and you haven't been promoted to a certain level, it's never going to happen for you. Just forget it. And I went into at and as an older person. Um, I'd done a bunch of stuff, and I, I didn't start till I was 30, so I needed to get promoted quick if that was going to happen. And uh, years went by and nothing happened. And I saw other people getting promoted and it was like, you know, I, I'm in the wrong place. And, you know, I, and I, re, I was getting ready to start my own business. And I remember laying in bed one night and uh, I was asleep at about two in the morning. I woke up, just sat straight up in the bed. And it was like a voice came to me. Joe, you're not going to get promoted at at and t And I thought, well, Okay, so I went back to sleep and relaxed about it. And uh, started, you know, kept working on my plan to start my own business. Six months later, I got promoted. <laughs> I guess I ate too much pizza uh, the night before, too many tacos. I don't know what it was. But, uh, you know, the anxiousness was really in me. But the truth is, God's mapped it all out. Got it all controlled. Rested. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'll help us to trust you. It's, we admit, Lord, it's not always easy when we see the storms around us, but we pray that you'll help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a captive brand. Uh, this is a brand that a, re a retailer, normally it's a retailer, sometimes it's a distributor, pays a fee to the manufacturer, the owner of the brand, that they will be the sole source for selling that brand. So for example, Martha Stewart collection, only available at Macy's. Now, actually, Martha got into a big lawsuit because she started selling her stuff at other places besides Macy's. And so Macy's sued her for something like $200 million because she was selling the stuff at other places. And she said, no, 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 read your contract. The contract is for the Martha Stewart collection. And these are Martha Stewart something else, not the Martha Stewart collection. So it was the word collection, and she won big, right? Sell, sell it all over the place, they paid her a ton. So you remember AT&T was the first provider of the iPhone. They had that the iPhone brand captive for a year, right? A captive brand, a family brand. So here is Heinz ketchup, but hold it. It's Heinz honey and sweet relish and mustard and mayonnaise and, and uh, ranch dressing and tartar sauce. And it's a family of products. And I don't know which tartar sauce I want, but I like Heinz ketchup. <clears throat> so I, bought, I use Heinz for a bunch of stuff. It's a family of products 
that provide me what I need, right? family brand. An individual brand. Again, I'm reinforcing these things. So here, this is Irish Spring. Anybody use Irish Spring? Okay, Irish Spring, I use this stuff. Irish Spring is a soap that um, was made for sweaty guys, athletic guys. And uh, it's made by Colgate Palmolive. Well, when you think of soap for sweaty guys to use in their shower, you don't want to think Colgate, right? Because you think toothpaste. I don't want to clean myself with toothpaste. Teeth fine. When you think palm olive, you think dishwasher soap. But again, I don't want to wash myself with dishwasher soap. And so they came up with Irish Spring as an individual brand. And you don't find the name Colgate Palm Olive on the box because that would hinder sales. So we treat the product individually, separate from the company, an individual brand. We market as though it's not part of the normal company offerings. Brand equity, yes. Good. Brand equity. So here what we're saying is that the brand has become so valuable that the brand name, the brand in and of itself has value externally from the product. So for example, say your dad owns a hardware store and they're gonna sell that hardware store, uh, time to retire. And he's got $200,000 worth of tools in there and the building's worth $200,000. And yet when he puts it up for sale, he offers $800,000 for the, for the hardware store. Well, how can you get $400,000 worth of value and they're asking $800,000 for it? In small business, we call that goodwill. But what it says is that the brand name of uh, Frank's Hardware has long-term value. No matter who owns it, as long as it's Frank's hardware store, people are going to come to that hardware store expecting service and good service. And so they're going to spend money continually over the next few years. And it has a continual stream of income because of the brand. So the brand itself has value. Now, many companies have started putting the value of the brand on their balance sheet. Now, this can be dangerous. So, for example, um, Time Warner uh, decided that uh, they, uh, they wanted to expand more dramatically into the internet world. And uh, so, they decided that they were going to buy an internet company. So they bought AOL and they renamed Time Warner AOL because they think the future is in the internet, right? So they bought AOL and they renamed the company AOL and they spent $7 billion just extra just because they wanted the name AOL, the brand name, right? Well, two years later, dial up goes away high speed internet comes in and is, is any of you anybody use AOL the brand wasn't worth so much so they changed their name two years later to Time Warner AOL and then two years later they changed their name back to Time Warner <laughs> and they have spent seven billion bucks for nothing because they thought it had equity and carrying power, but it didn't. Brand equity.
If I'm going to buy Tabasco sauce, I buy McElhaney's. To some of you, if you're going to buy something like that, it's Texas Pete. Right? That's the South Carolina brand, and it has value in that. So here are two terms of things that we probably need to understand. Um, I'll use one of these in next week's lecture pretty strongly, or next class lecture. The brand manager. Now here, we've got a person or a number of people whose job is to manage the brand. They're in charge of the brand. And that's all they spend their time during the day is managing the brand. So for example, I'm at Bell South. And for our industry marketing, we made literature uh, for, for trying to promote Frame Relay to each one of our industries. So we had one for manufacturing, one for finance, one for schools, all sorts of stuff. And um, so we designed all this stuff up and then had it all printed. And it was $250,000 print to go to all of our salespeople to give to our clients. And so uh, Marilyn comes by my office and said, I said, Marilyn, how are we doing on printing the, uh, the collateral, the, the sales sheets? And she said, well, that's really why I'm here to talk to you. The brand manager has changed the colors for the things that surround Bell South. So she pulls up this document, right? And it was, you know, she folds it out. And she says, so this is, was Bell South blue. Then they changed the color to this. Well, I couldn't really tell the difference between the two. And now orange is really the primary color of almost everything we do in Bell South. And I'm like, oh, this is just nonsense. And she says, so Joe, we can't use any of the literature. It's all printed, but we have to redo it and change the colors and print it all again. I'm like, that's $250,000. And she says, yeah, that's just the way it is. And I said, well, okay, Marilyn, just send out the literature. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. She says, no, Joe, you really don't understand. And I said, Look, Marilyn, when I came, and I guess you really knew this, um, they hadn't created a new product in Bell South for the last five years. And so they brought somebody in who could get things done. So my job had been to get things done. The first uh, 18 months, we delivered uh, five new products to the market. And we were getting things done. And so I was there to break through boundaries. And so I said, I'll handle it. She said, Joe, you really don't understand this one. I said, no, I'll handle it. She was right. I couldn't handle it. The brand manager owned the brand. And when they said the color was orange, the color was orange. And so I said, uh, I had to come back to Marilyn E. Crow and said, hey, we need to redo all the literature, change the colors. And I said, and uh, bill the brand management people. She says, Joe, you don't understand. They're not going to take the bill. I said, They've known they were going to change these colors for six months. And if they'd have just told us, we would have been able to sell, save $250,000 just for me. And that's not including everybody else in the company. They just need to tell people we would have waited. And she says, no, Joe, that's not how this works. I said, just go ahead and bill it to them. She says, Joe, it's, it's not going to happen. She was right. It didn't happen. So, oh, well. The second one is the category manager. Um, so a category manager is the person who will ma manage a line of goods, a category of goods. So I, when I was uh, younger, I had this friend um, who was, uh, he had just finished being a uh, linebacker for the University of Houston, and he was huge. I mean, they went big. He was 280 pounds, six foot six but could run a hundred yard dash in 10.7 seconds. 
And why he didn't make the pros, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, he was big. And so he goes to work for Montgomery Ward, and they put him as the brain, the category manager for women's lingerie. And so he go, he says, I got to know my product. So he goes in the women's lingerie department in one of his stores, you know, the store that I was in, to uh, to try to understand women's lingerie better. So of course these women with this tall, black, strong guy, they you know they they come up and just do you think this will look good on me? Is this the right size for me? Uh, he didn't stay there very long. Uh, move on, but category. So he they run a category. So for example, let's say you come up with a barbecue sauce and you want Walmart to carry it. So what you'll do is you'll fly into Bentonville and you'll rent a hotel and on Wednesday mornings, they do this on Wednesday, and they'll have this line of hundreds of people who want to sell their products to Walmart. And they just line up. And so you'll have an appointment with the category manager for condiments. Right? And so they'll, they'll, all the people who are trying to sell their barbecue sauce and their mustard, they go through this person. And finally, your turn comes up, and so you've got your barbecue sauce, and you've got it on. You've got it there for them to taste on chicken and on beef and on, you know, all sorts of different things. You got your barbecue sauce, so they can taste it and taste how it's better. So they taste it like your barbecue sauce. So that one person, that category manager, determines that they're going to give you a chance in Walmart. So what they do is they give you an order uh, for six months. And they put you in 28 Walmarts. And if your inventory turn, okay, inventory turn means you put stuff on the shelf, it completely clears out, and then they replace it. Yeah, that's a turn, right? So your turn for six months has to be 18. Then normally in Walmart, every product has an inventory turn of 36. So in six months, it's 18. So you have to completely sell out the shelves 18 times during those six months. If your barbecue sauce clears the shelves 18 times during that six months, in all those 28 stores, you go national. That's the only test. You go national. If it doesn't clear those 18, then they pull it off and they'll never put it on again. We'll not consider you again because they look at their shelf space as real estate and it has to generate a certain amount of money and it does that through inventory turn. <clears throat> so identifying the product, some things that identify the product, the name of the product can be really, really critical. When Steve Jobs got fired from Apple, he starts this new company. And uh, so they, he, he hires this advertising firm to decide what he should name the company. And they named the company Next. And he paid $200 million to that advertising company to come up with the term, the, the brand name Next. Now, I would have done it for $100 million. Right. Tough to come up with the word Next. So the brand name, that can be words, a word, it could be several words, it could be a number, it could be letters in a number, like um, the 3M company, that's the brand name, right, which we all know, the brand mark. So the mark can includes things like the name or a term that you use some slogan, some sl sign, or some symbol. So when we say the brand mark, it could have included a lot of different things. So the Pillsbury Doughboy is a brand mark. Pillsbury is a brand mark. Right now it's a brand name, but it's also a brand mark. A generic name. So. A generic name is when you, often the generic name comes from the first product that comes out in the category. So generic name is a branded name 
that becomes synonymous with the category, right? So example, if I need to blow my nose, I use a Kleenex, right? So I'll say, hey, I need a Kleenex. But really, I use puffs. And I use the puffs with the liquid so uh, softener in it. But I say I need a Kleenex. And I grab a puffs. But the category is Kleenex. That's the generic name, right? Versus generic product. You remember generic product is where we put that white label on there. The generic name is the name, the brand name becomes synonymous for the field. So for example, many of you uh, closed your pants today with a zipper. Actually, you probably didn't because zipper is the brand name of the, of the zipper corporation. But most zippers nowadays are made in China and they're not made by the zipper corporation, <laughs> All right? But it's, it's synonymous. So this morning, I quickly ran up to there because I had forgotten to print off the uh, uh, quizzes. And so I Xeroxed them. Actually, I didn't Xerox them because we don't have a Xerox, we have a Canon. So I guess I canonized them. But, but when I say I need them Xerox, you understand what I mean because it's generic, yeah. So in Wisconsin, um, Coke would be a generic name, right? Because in Wisconsin, you say you go to a restaurant and say, I want a Coke, and they say, what kind? And you say, I want a uh, Pepsi. It's just a generic name for it. So yes, Coke would fit all three of these. Yep. You hear something new at Fountains today. People who think young say, Pepsi, please. The lively crowd today agrees. Those who think young say, Pepsi, please. Pepsi. For those who think young. Come alive. Come alive. You're in the Pepsi generation. You're in the Pepsi generation. You're in the Pepsi generation. So a brand mark um, a, a, is, so for example, the uh, uh, Jolly Green Giant. So a symbol, here's your definition for a symbol. A symbol is a pictorial image that represents the brand. <clears throat> and of course, a symbol is a brand mark, but um, it's a special kind. It's a pictorial image. So the Jolly Green Giant, uh, the Pillsbury Doughboy, the Apple, symbols that stand for the company. You see it, you see the Apple, and you know, uh, I know what company is. Don't have any question. Good. So a trademark. A trademark is going to grant the rights to the product. Now, there are, there is, of course, a trademark, which you will see at TM. And to trademark something, all you have to do is put it and put a TM on a piece of paper. You put the, the whatever you're trademarking, put a TM and, and you date it and you've trademarked it. That's all there is to it. A registered trademark 
is when you register that trademark that you've already got with a government agency in the United States, it's the US Patent and Trade Ar Trademark Office. And um, <clears throat> so you trade, you register your trademark and then it has an R. So on this uh, ad over here, what do you think is trademarked? Like what? Give me exact details. The images. Which ones? The designs of all of them. So the, the girl? Yeah. Yeah, they trademarked the girl. Now she, just in case she becomes popular. She didn't become popular, but you never know. So what else? The bottle. The bo yes, actually the bottle is trademarked. So Pepsi has a straight uh, bottle and Coke has the curvy bottle because Coca-Cola trademarked the curvy bottle and nobody else in the world has trade uh, in the country has a uh, curvy bottle for anything because Coke owns the curvy bottle. Trademark. What else? Okay, clearly Coca-Cola, right, and there's the registered trademark, and Coca-Cola Classic, which is the all registered, that's a uh, trademark, which of course they changed the name, right? And uh, so how about the bottle cap? Yeah, how about the bottle cap always? Yeah, how about Curvy Volcanic? Yes, just in case Curvy Volcanic became uh, popular, which it didn't, uh, Coke's gonna trademark everything they can so that they own it. Uh, so Phil Jackson, the uh, coach of the uh, Chicago Bulls, back when he was coach there, and when they won their second world championship, trademarked the term three-peat. And so when they came back the next year and won for the third time in a row, and they called it the three-peat, everybody had these t-shirts that said three-peat on it. And Phil Jackson was paid for every single one of those. Every time anybody used the term three-peat, they had to pay Phil Jackson because he owned the term three-peat because it was a registered trademark. So anybody ever seen the Wiener Mobile driving around Atlanta? Oh man, they've got one drives around Atlanta all the time responsible, for, I think for at least 25% of the accidents. It, it, on the freeways in Atlanta. I'd be driving down the freeway in Atlanta going to work and I'd see the Wienermobile. Of course, I, you know, it's the Wienermobile. It, you know, it catches your eye. And so I'm listening on the radio and you hear all these accidents <laughs> every time I drove by. So this guy in California decides he loves the Wienermobile. So he made a Wienermobile. He took his car and constructed a Wiener. Just so look just like the Wienermobile, made a perfect replica of the Wienermobile. And so Oscar Meyer took him to court and they won because the Wienermobile is a registered trademark of the Oscar Meyer Corporation. And he had spent a, something like $120,000 taking his car on top of his car, making it into a Wienermobile, and he had to give it to Oscar Meyer. They didn't have to pay him for it. He had no legal right to make it. Trademarks. Trade dress. So trade dress. So you remember when we when I showed that first Nike commercial, as soon as it came on, you knew that was a Nike commercial. Because it had this Nike commercials has this feel to it, right? So it has these visual cues that lets you know that this is a Nike commercial. It's a Nike product. So the trade dress are the visual cues that surround the branding efforts that let you get a feel, a look and feel. So for example, here, Cadillac. Watch a Cadillac commercial. They never have clouds in the commercials. And they want you to have a wide open feeling with a Cadillac. And so they always have clear skies. Most of the time they run it, they run the car through the desert. So it's wide open. Everything with Cadillac is wide open. So they've got this blue sky and that's their trade dress. Along with that is, they use black for Cadillac and their, their second line is blue. And they want that to be consistent every single time. So you'll see ads for things 
and they put the logo in the exact same place every single time. So we make the colors the same. So this is where I got trapped with Bell South. They had changed, the brand manager had changed the trade dress for Bell, Bell South. So I had to throw away all that literature because we had a new trade dress, the, the visual clues that surround it. When I was at CenturyLink, we had a darker, we had a blue sky about like this, a little, little lighter, that's maybe about this light uh, up here. And then we had three clouds over here and a cloud over here. That was a part of our trade dress. Right? And we were red, white, and blue. So all the stuff we did around was red, white, and blue because we were we wanted to be up, you know, promote America. So it's the trade dress. It lets me look at it and know that's what this is. Now, globally, when you take your trademarks global, you can get into trouble. So for example, the Electrolux company, which is a Scandinavian company, they got this guy who had got a marketing degree. He was Scandinavian, but uh, he got a marketing degree in America. So they put him in charge of marketing to America. So his slogan was that they used was nothing sucks like Electrolux, which wasn't exactly good. Uh, Coors, when they took Coors to Latin America, uh, they had this uh, slogan that they were using in America, turn it loose. So, but when they translated into Spanish, um, it basically said you were going to suffer from diarrhea. Um, when Gerber started selling baby food in Africa, you guys know what Gerber, you get the little bottles of uh, baby food and they got the baby on there, right? Every year they do a contest for who's going to be the new baby, right? So they started selling that in Africa, right? And they put a, uh, a black baby on there. Well, they didn't know that in Africa, in order to, because there's a lot of illiteracy in Africa. So what they do is they, to make sure people know what's in the jar or the can, they put a picture of what the contents are on the jar or can. So everybody thought this is chopped up babies. Didn't sell well, right? Um, Pepsi uh, takes uh, Pepsi to, to uh, Taiwan. And uh, the, you heard uh, Britney Spears a few minutes ago singing the uh, uh, song where it was come alive with the Pepsi generation. So they took that slogan into Taiwan, but when it was sung in Taiwanese, uh, I think they're Cantonese down the, the, the language of Cantonese down there. So when they sang it, it came out that it brings back your ancestors from the dead, which is a problem in Taiwan because 30% of the population of Taiwan are animists. They worship their ancestors. So we gotta be careful how we do this when we go overseas. Packaging. There are three purposes for a package. Number one, a package purpose is to protect against damage, spoilage, and pilferage. So you get some package, you know, 30% of the cost of your products that you buy are package. Because we don't want the package, the stuff inside to get damaged. So I got this book yesterday from Amazon and it came in a box that was a foot long and eight inches wide and had all this plastic stuff in there to keep the book from being damaged, all right? Packaging, they don't want somebody to run a forklift into a television. So they put all this styrofoam up there to protect it so it doesn't get broken. Spoilage, they don't want it spoiled. Do you know that milk um, deteriorates from light? So back when I was a kid, they started making milk in yellow jugs. Have you ever seen milk in a yellow jug? Okay, milk in a yellow jug lasts three weeks longer than in a clear jug because the light from the store, in the store, 
deter goes through the clear and deteriorates the milk. So for a while when I was a kid, they came up with milk in black cartons. And it lasted a month and a half longer because it was in a black carton. But nobody wanted to buy milk in a black carton. And the reason we don't have milk in yellow cartons is because people want to see that it's just, I don't know what it is, but we want to see that it's milk as though it's not milk because it's in yellow carton, but people buy more in clear plastic. And so the milk comes in clear plastic, even though it spoils quicker. And we also want to prevent pilferage. So one of the goals for Walmart is that every product would have an RFID on it. I don't know if you're familiar with RFID. It's a radio frequency tag. And this, they want to put that radio frequency tag on everything. And what it does is it's a, it's a little radio and it broadcasts its number 250 feet. That's all, that's all the battery is in there. It'll do 250 feet. But what they want is, and this is the goal for Walmart, that you're pulling your cart around and you take your item off the shelf and you put it into your cart, right? And then you walk around and then they want to paint a yellow line by the, by the register. And you walk past that yellow line. And as soon as you walk past that yellow line, everything in your cart is rung up. Then they have a red line and you push it past the red line. And as soon as you pass it by your red line, it bills it to your credit card. So of course, this little thing right here on my credit card, that's an RFID. So it will trans, you give Walmart permission. And when you walk past that line, it bills everything in your cart to you. It's also great for inventory control because then they know everything that's purchased if somebody walks out of the store and the product hasn't been purchased, they automatically know. So at Walmart nowadays, all the big things that we buy are purchased or have an RFID on there. Okay, So it protects against damage, spoilage, and pilferage. Did you know that 11% of everything Walmart buys to resell is stolen? 11%. 9% of it is sold by employees. The second reason uh, for, for packaging is that what we want it to assist in marketing the product. So let's say you want to buy a big screen television. So you look in Walmart at all the big screen televisions, and then you got to go get it, right? So you look at these boxes and, and at that, uh, the TV, it's, your, it's got this code, AC456B. And so you're looking for AC 54, and what was it? And you look again, you look at, just put a picture of the television on the box so that people can find it, right? It aids in marketing. And finally, for cost effectiveness. So, You guys know what that is, right? You guys got, got to take our appreciation. Right? So this is the back end of a truck. Right? Yeah. Okay. So this is a back end of a truck. Now you probably know that the important thing with trucks is whether it weights out or it cubes out. Okay. So for a weight out, a, a semi like this can hold 43 thousand pounds of stuff right and and then it's cubes out at oh, 3700 cubic square feet i think i got that right maybe it's 39 so uh 3983 comes to my head but uh, anyway so when i was an american tea and coffee company we sold our peanut butter we you know it was in glass jars peanut butter was in glass jars PET hadn't come out. So what we did is we put the peanut butter on, on pallets, right? And we put two pallets all the way down. And when we did that, we waited out. But PET came out, the clear plastic, polyethylene tritrate. And that enabled us, it lowered the weight 
and we could put two pallets on, which cut our transportation cost in half. And we didn't go PET because it wouldn't break. We went PET because it cut our transportation cost in half, right? So um, cost effectiveness. So a label. Um, what are we doing? How are we doing on time? We got three minutes. I think we got time for this. You guys are familiar with the barcode? Right, there's the 8, 16, 32 character. You know the thickness of this line represents a number. It actually comes from Morris code. So the guys took Morris code and took, put it in the thickness of the line. That's why under here is our numbers. So if they can't scan it, they type in the numbers because all, all the bars do, they, they're a number, right? So it makes it quicker. So um, our label helps speed our processing, right? Some of you, um, I know one of the groups has some juice, right? And so the ingredients on the label are critical for what's gonna happen for them. So the universal product code, this barcode represents the universal product code, okay? And this universal product code is you get that from a government agency, you take your new product, you get a UPC code, okay? And then the company has what they call a SKU. Anybody ever dealt with SKUs before? Yeah, stock keeping unit, okay? S-T-O-C-K, stock keeping unit, okay? And what happens is that the UPC code is tied to the stock keeping unit code that the company has. And so when you scan the barcode, it reads the UPC code and the company knows what the SKU is because they're tied together and then it can ring up your bill. Plastic protecting products. Marketing, the only marketing these little orange slices does is they have the can. Put it on the, in a, uh, in a convenience store. So environmental regulatory, when's that, is that due today? Yes. They just submit it by midnight. Uh, do I give you to midnight tonight? Yeah, so just make sure that's done. You guys have a great one.